Um, so we were looking at scheduling, and we have this situation where we have a particular kernel thread that might be running that calls yield. Right? And what that will then do is mark this um, process as runnable, and then run the scheduler. And if you remember the scheduler, sorry, sketch, right? So where sketch, uh, so what does sketch look like? Sketch is actually Sketch, 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 where'd it go? There it is. All right, this is going to do the switch from one context to another context. So basically, we are running a thread in the kernel. Okay? So a kernel thread associated with a process. We are going to run sketch. It'll run the switch, and now it'll switch to where? So from the kernel thread of, for some particular process to what thread? Scheduler. Scheduler, because that's what it says right here, the scheduler. So the scheduler is its own thread, and the scheduler thread is always going to be in the scheduler. Okay. And the scheduler sometimes switches out of the scheduler and switches to some other context. It could be back to the same context that we were in. But that's the, the flow of things is always going to be that we're going from one thread into the scheduler and then out to another thread. Back to the scheduler, out to another thread. Back to the scheduler, out to another thread. Does that make sense? All right. Now let's go back and look at the locking. So we're in a thread. We acquire the p-table lock, right? We acquire the p-table lock because we're changing the state of this process. We have to keep the lock through the sketch, okay? Until we actually switch to a different thread. Because otherwise what could happen is we've marked this process as runnable, that is, it's not running, yet it's still running. So we're going to hold on to this lock. And we're going to basically get ourselves into the scheduler. Where are we going to go in the scheduler? We're going to go the last place we switched out from. So we're going to come back in here in the scheduler. And the scheduler is going to switch the KVM. The scheduler had already acquired the lock as well. Here. And it's going to go through, find another process. Another process is going to go in, and we're going to swap to that context, which is going to take us back to where? Back to here, because this is where the switch happens. So, sorry, inside sketch. So it's going to take us inside sketch, and that will return us back to here. So we are going to, in, let's see. Thread one will acquire this. Okay? And thread one is now runnable but not running. Thread two is going to come back in here on its own stack, right? And it'll start running again. So it got saved because it yielded in the past. <laughs> So what's it going to do? It's going to release the lock. Okay. So one thread is acquiring the lock, and another thread is releasing the lock. And this works because we're ensuring that we have the proper locking and unlocking, but we can't have the thread that's going to sleep also unlock the process table. 
Okay? Because until it's actually no longer running, we have to keep the process table locked. Does that make sense? So when process thread one <coughs> comes back and runs again, it will then go ahead and do a release. And it looks like it's releasing the same lock it acquired, but it's actually releasing a different lock that was acquired by another thread. Sketch and scheduler are kind of weird, okay? In that, scheduler calls sketch. Sorry, let me back up a second. Sketch calls into scheduler, and scheduler eventually is going to. Right, it'll switch back into another process, and eventually that process is called yield, which will call sketch. So sketch and scheduler are calling each other. And they're calling each other not as normal subroutine calls, but instead, when you leave one of these two, it goes to where the other one was when it stopped. And when that one leaves, it goes to where the other one was stopped. So these are, instead of having regular subroutines, where A calls B. And so this runs the entirety of B. Instead, we have A, which is, I'm going to I'm going to use yield because just that's what we use in something like um, Python. But basically, yielding here, B yielding here, and they're ping-ponging back and forth with each other. Okay? So coroutines know where they're going and know where they came from. And they resume where they were. So it's not like you're starting the scheduler all over again every time. You're running this one thread that's running forever, and it always leaves to go to another thread that runs, and then comes back to the same spot. Questions on that? All right. If our process is running, then our CPU registers are, are basically the CPU is holding the state that's necessary for this process. Okay, so it's basically the registers, right? Including the stack pointer. Uh, so stack pointer is certainly an important one. The instruction pointer is an important one. The uh, page directory is an important one. And then if it's runnable, the CPU is not running it, and therefore the CPU is not holding all those registers. So therefore we need to save those registers somewhere else. So the context is holding all the important information. All right? Does that make sense? So, and we just need to ensure that that's, that that's always the case. And none of the CPUs is holding the processes page table. None of the CPUs is executing on its stack. And um, none of the CPUs proc that tells what process is running refers to that. Right? So it's, if it's Runnable, it's not running anywhere. That is the stuff saved by switch. So, yeah. Okay. So in XV6, let's say, Sarah, what if a timer interrupt happens while we're in the kernel? Or can a timer interrupt happen while we're in the kernel? Actually, hold on just a second. So XV6, the answer is yes. Joss, the answer is no. Okay. So. For JOS, it's not as interesting. But for XV6, let's say a timer interrupt <coughs> happens. What is the kernel thread stack going to look like? So here's our kernel thread stack. Okay. 
And let's say, let's see, zero is here, all right? So what's on the bottom of the stack for the kernel thread stack? Staying with you, Sarah. Okay, local variables. Well, actually, so we know what's at the bottom of the stack because how did we enter into this kernel thread? Originally. Originally? Originally. From switching into it? Uh, so let's go back to, remember, there are a variety of ways we can go from user mode into kernel mode, right? So pick one of those. Interrupt with a system call? System call sounds good. Okay, so we had a system call. And so what's on, the, what's on here? What's at the very bottom of this? <coughs> okay, return address and other, well, and other stuff. Yeah. Pushed by the hardware because we did an interrupt. Mm -hmm. 48, whatever it was. 40. 40. So this stuff is our trap frame, right? Mm -hmm. And then we've got locals and stuff like that. All right. Now, what happens? Now, we get an interrupt. So, what goes on the kernel uh, stack? The register, the kernel registers the trap frame again, right? Yeah. We're going to get another trap frame, minus we're not going to have the stack pointer or the, um, whatever that associated uh, uh, segment register is. Okay. Okay, so we've got our timer stack frame, and then let's say that this, so this is a timer interrupt. So we're gonna go in the trap frame, we're gonna have local variables for let's say trap, right? And then what do we do in case of a timer interrupt? Drew, in XV6? Yeah, what, and what we want to do is we want to yield, right? We want to give up time. Yield calls sketch calls switch, okay? And what switch going to do? Switch is going to take us out of here, and we're going to go run another kernel thread stack frame. So we're going to have this stack frame of our original system call, plus our timer interrupt, plus in and handling the timer interrupt, all the calls back up to switch. And this guy is now going to be marked as not runnable. Okay? But the stack, frame, the stack is still there, right? It's just not the current stack anymore. And eventually, later on, we decide, okay, let's make this thing run, let's, make, let's run this thing on some CPU. We're gonna come, come back. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Say that again? Like, I thought in JOS, you could interrupt the kernel if you marked it as being able to mark the kernel. One could. JOS expects that we won't have interrupts um, while we're running. So XV6, we mark system calls as interruptible, uh, but not in JOS. You could, it'd just be, it wouldn't be good, because it would, it's not designed that way. Can't some system calls take like a long time to execute though? So yes, we'll talk a little bit more about that in fact today. Um, their JOS system calls don't take as long. There, there aren't as very long ones as there are in XP6. Cool. So. Is like reading from a file? I mean, that's inherently going to take a while. You have to, you have to wait for Yes, and if that were in the kernel in JOS, then that would be an issue, but it's not. So, yeah, good question. Um, so when we're yielding, 
Remember yield call schedule. We want to make sure we're not holding. We want to make sure we are holding the p-table lock. And we want to make sure that we're not holding any other locks. Because if we're holding any other locks, then, and this is not great to be holding locks and not be running, right? Because then anyone else who wants that lock is, 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 is sort of stuck. Thread cleanup, we're going to come back and look at with today's lecture notes. So I may pull some of those slides back up, but we'll see. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about now is thread switching homework, right? basically sleeping and waking. Uh, the, and the potential problems with sleeping and waking up. So the idea of sleeping and waking up is I want to wait for some condition to happen, and rather than um, spin, spinning, waiting and looking, I want to just say, put me to sleep and let me know when I should go check again. That's, that's the idea. Okay. The idea of sleeping, we're going to be looking at the implementation of sleep and wake in XV6. Um, and we don't, the ideas are, are common to lots of different things. So here's our threading with the thread switch, right? The idea was you were to fill in here the saving the registers. And it push AL is kind of handy because it pushes uh, the, the registers that we wanted to save. So back up a second. So this is XV6, right? We've got. This threading library, right? Well, this threading program that creates threads. But I said the other day that XV6 has how many user threads per process? One. One. So how can we have more than one thread, right? How can we be creating multiple threads here? So it's a little weird how that could be. And basically what happens is we define a thread by a stack pointer and a stack and a state of what state it's in. Okay? And then we just have an array of these for however many threads we can have. So if you think about it, with, within a particular process, a thread is, is just a separate stack with its own stack pointer. So to switch from one thread to another just means change the stack pointer to point to this stack. If we want to run another thread, change the stack pointer to point to this stack. Another thread, change the stack pointer to point to this stack. Now, when that movement happens is going to be a, a different question. One simple way would be if each thread yields Right? If each thread says, I am now willing to give up, and then it's fairly easy to write code that can schedule. Just go through, find one that's runnable, and say, OK, that's the next one. And then we're going to need to do a switch, which will change the stack pointers. Save the registers into the stack, change the stack pointer, and when we come back, restore the registers. All right. Um, and so we see here the explicit calls to thread yield. So to do non-preemptive thread switching is certainly possible just from user mode. So the kernel knows nothing about these threads. They're just a figment of the process's imagination. What if we want to do preemptive? What would we need? Okay. We would need a timer. Yes. Wait. XV6. Timer. If only we had a system call <laughs> with a callback with an alarm. Hey, we do. So we could do that. Right? We could actually have periodic go ahead and do the switching for us. 
Remember, so set it a set a callback to get callback in however many units we want, and then when that happens, switch threads. So we can actually do preemptive multi-threading. Here's what we don't get because we have only a single user thread. And that is as far as the operating system is concerned, there's one process. So if that one process issues a read, it's going to put that process to sleep and say, you are not runnable until the read completes. But that's one thread in your user program. What if there were other threads that wanted to do stuff that didn't need that data, right? That were, you know, yeah, you have, you have your one thread that's doing Bitcoin mining, and it doesn't need any of that, right? So all the threads went to sleep, though, because as far as the kernel's concerned, it's one process, it puts it to sleep because it tried to do a read, right? It had a blocking system call. That's what having multiple threads in the kernel allows is to allow some threads to go to sleep, but leave other threads in a process still running. Okay. Many OSs do allow that. We we'll, we'll have a, a short slide on that in the past, or er, shortly. Um, so one question here that was, I believe, on the homework was what is the ninth value on the stack when, uh, where were we? We were like, <coughs> here I think, is that right? <coughs> we're actually <coughs> here. Okay, so we just, we just swapped stack pointers. And now if we look on the stack, and we look at, we've got one, two, three, four longs, five, six, I don't know what the values are, seven, eight, and then we've got a value here. And the question is, what is that? Uh, Drew. I'm going to give you a hint. Pop AL, pops general registers, of which there are eight of them. So let's not answer, let's don't answer the question of what's the ninth one. What are these eight? Um, okay, so the ninth one is like, so just ignore that a second, and that's a good jump. Let's just first say, what are these eight? There will be eight corresponding to the pop AL. Okay, agreed with you. Now, what's the next line we're going to execute? Uh, return, so, so therefore, this had better be some uh, return address. Yes, so, yeah. so this is our return address. Uh, oh, and where is it going to be? Yeah, Brad. So you said those first eight are the general registers, but I thought you popped them off the stack. Or so we're about to pop them off. <coughs> oh, oh, it's before. Right after, yeah, right after we assign to the to the stack pointer, then those eight are theirs. We pop them off. That's a return address, and we return. Okay. And where do we return to? Uh, Miles, like where, what code will we be in when we return? So let's look. So thread switch is where we actually switch, right? Was that the one? Yeah. Yes. So therefore, when thread switch returns, this is where we come back to, which is inside of come, 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 thread schedule. And if we look at thread schedule, where did this get called from? This get called from yield. 
So basically, we're going to, okay, let's find thread yield. There's thread yield. So we're going to go into thread schedule, and then we're going to turn from there, yield, and then that'll take us back to wherever we were that called yield. All right. All right, so XV6. Go ahead, so Dave. Uh -huh. We're popping them into the registers. Yeah, so push pushes them from the registers, pop, pops them back into the registers. So I think your question is, what would allow a kernel to have one thread do a read and block and the other thread to run? Yeah. Basically what happens is what you, so our current idea of a process in XV6, would, which is everything with its own address space and a separate execution possibility, would be broken apart into threads, which says there's, there are some of these that share address spaces. Okay, and there are some that have different address spaces, but I can still schedule them all separately. Does that make sense? So it's just a generalization of the process idea. Um, but I guess like what allows that type of thread for like in modern operations, like one thread is leading for another thread. Because in the kernel, we're going to have a table. Right, right now we have a table uh, of a process table with a bunch of processes in it. We'll have a thread table instead with a bunch of threads. And some of them may share the same address space with each other. Okay? So two big advantages of this, right? One, one of them can be sleeping while others are still running. And the second is a lot of times for a multi-threaded application, you're writing it that way because you want to run it faster if there are multiple cores. In our U thread that we saw, as far as the kernel is concerned, in XV6, we have a single process, and so it's going to run on a single CPU. And so it doesn't matter how many CPUs we have, how many threads we have, it's still going to only run one thread at a time. Whereas if the um, OS can schedule multiple threads, because it actually sees them as distinct entities in the kernel, then it can put m multiple of them on on, on CPUs at once. Yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, and let's just look at how it's scheduling here. So, We come through the schedule. So this is not like XV6, where we have a schedule as a coroutine, and it's always returning back into it. Here, schedule gets called, and then it goes. It switches out, but eventually switches back and returns. So it goes through the, uh, all the threads to try and find a runnable one. And it skips the current one, right? Because we don't try and schedule this one necessarily. If there's nothing else to do, then we'll schedule this one. But so we run through and skip this one. And then, if this is the only one to run, we'll go ahead and run that. So which threads get priority for running in this approach? Giselle. She just left, didn't she? All right, I'm not going to ask. I will put her a little later down. That wouldn't be fair. Katie, so which threads have priority uh, in this approach? The ones that are up next in the queue, so the ones that... It's not a queue. It's, a, it's, a, it's an array. Or the array, but like the ones that have, been, have not been run. Okay, 
yeah, and for any scheduler, we want, we're skipping all the ones that aren't runnable. So we're going to be picking runnable ones, but as far as this table's concerned, which ones have priority? If I've got two runnable ones, which one is going to be chosen? Yeah, first in the array, which is different from the XV6 scheduler. Because remember in the XV6 scheduler, we're a coroutine, and we're doing a for loop through every item. And so it, start, it, it continues where it last left off. So it's always going forward and around, whereas this one is always start from the beginning until it finds one. Okay. All right. Leaving the homework. A lot of times, you want to have multiple threads that are coordinating with each other, especially for sequencing, when one thing happens and another thing happens. So we want to, for instance, our disk read to complete. Remember we put our whole process to sleep because we did a read? And so we want to, we'd like to wake up once the read is completed. If we're, we have a pipe and we have two processes, one writing into the pipe and one reading from the pipe, a pipe is actually implemented by a buffer in kernel memory. So therefore, we have to make sure that when the writer is writing, that it doesn't keep writing once the buffer's full. So if the buffer does fill, the writer needs to wait. Conversely, if you have a fast reader and the reader empties the buffer, then once it's empty, the reader needs to wait until the writer has written some stuff. So that's an example of where we need this coordination. Waiting for a child exit. So when you do wait, that waits, <laughs> unless you don't have any children that have any unweighted for children. So this is another example where you want one process to be waiting on another process's exit. We don't want a spin lock to do this. Right? These can be lengthy operations. So we don't want to be spinning all this time for two reasons. It chews up CPU time, but as well, if we held a spin lock, uh, Let's say we have one CPU, and we have a pipe, and the reader has an empty buffer and wants to wait for the writer, but is holding a spin lock, preventing the other process from even running and fixing things. So spin lock's bad. Choose up CPU time, and uh, may prevent the other process from uh, I don't know how to always say this. We the process from causing the waited for event. Let's say. So we're going to do something different. We're going to do sleep and wake. Uh, your next homework is actually, I think that's homework nine, is using condition variables uh, and barriers which is a, these are just different synchronization primitives. So here's what sleep and wake are going to look, up, look like. We have sleep. Sleep takes a channel and a lock. I'll get to the lock in a bit. So the channel is just an, an address, a place to register. This is what I'm interested in. So they're just unique values. It's just integers, really. So I can say I want to sleep on one. And then you could say, OK, I want to wake up whoever is sleeping on one. Two, three, four, and so on. In order to um, agree on what numbers to use, we don't have a big set of constants that says channel one, channel two, channel three. Instead, if we're both working with some variable, then we just use the address of that variable. That's an integer. Works fine, right? As long as we both agree, the sleeper and the wake upper, then then that works. So. We sleep on a channel. What does that mean? That means that we're going to go to sleep. Okay? We will no longer be runnable. And again, we provide the channel. And we will not return until we get woken up. Wake up wakes up all the threads sleeping. Not one, all of them. It may make more than one thread. But like, if there's more than one sleeping, it will wake more than one. It is up to the code, the user of the sleep and the user of the wake up, who will be different threads, to agree on when they'll be woken up. Okay? 
So the sleeper is going to sleep because they're waiting for something to happen. But the API doesn't ever specify anything about that. Okay? So there's nothing about this that says, I'm sleeping, waiting for uh, uh, this process to exit. I'm sleeping, waiting for this disk grade to complete. Nothing like that. Just, I'm sleeping. And the wake-up guy has to have intelligence and say, oh, if this situation occurs, that's a good place to wake this person up. This is really key. Sleep may return. So this would be even, an even better sentence if it said false. Okay? So you may be woken up waiting for your child to exit, and your child may not have exited. It may have, it may not have. In general, you should assume when you return from sleep, that's just a hint that says, now would be a good, idea, good time to look and see if the condition you were waiting for happens. So you're always going to write your code for sleeps inside a while loop that checks whatever condition you're interested in. A uh, good example would be the buffer for a pipe. Right? You're reading from a pipe. So you want to say, while the buffer is empty, sleep. And a writer will write some stuff in it, wake everybody up who's waiting, and yet theoretically you come back and the buffer's empty again. Right? So it seems like the semantics of whether the condition is true or false is kind of like an ad hoc API that you define. In your code. It, it, yes. So you could define that API in such a way that like, you don't have to use the while loop, right? You could. Like conventionally you don't yeah. do that? You could, but in general you don't. And, there, and it, even, if you're, even if the way you have set stuff up is you're guaranteed no one's going to wake you unless it's actually true, it doesn't hurt you to write it as a, as a while. And it's a, it can save some problems. Yeah, Giselle? Uh, so, so the second argument to sleep, what does that actually do? We don't get to talk about that yet. Okay. So we will, we will put that on the stack. Yeah, it's operating system jokes are so funny. So, Go ahead. <laughs> No, I am not saying that. Sleep will only happen because someone has woken up. Let me give you an example where this could happen. We have a pipe. We have a writer to the pipe. And we have two readers. Is that possible? Yes, because we pipe, we fork, and now we have two possible readers. So both these readers go to sleep because the buffer is empty. The writer writes some stuff. Once it writes some stuff to the buffer, what should it do? Wake up who? Everybody who's waiting. One of these is going to run first. It reads everything in the buffer. It says, oh, I'm going back to sleep. This guy now wakes up, right? It runs. He was already woken up, but he runs. And this guy looks and says, wait, there's nothing in the buffer. Well, there was when the wake up happened, but you didn't win the race. Okay. Right. Just there can be two readers for a pipe, okay. and so that's what happened here. So you can imagine the same case if you have two writers, yeah. again, where they're waiting for it to be non full. Yeah. Why does the Dave? buffer become empty by the second reader? Because the first reader uh, is greedy and reads everything that's in the buffer. Yeah, reading takes stuff out of the buffer, writing writes stuff into the buffer. So if like, that happens like, on the very last bit of data that the writer is writing, and then you'll have like, one reader take that last bit of information, and then the other reader wins like, the other reader's turn, and there's like nothing there, it's like goes back to sleep, but it'll technically never be like, woke. We will look at the actual pipe implementation. It is important that. Two things happen. One, if the writer goes away, these readers need to know there's nothing, nothing ever coming, right? There's nothing more coming to this. And second, what if it was sleeping when this happened? How do we know? How is it going to get woken up? So we'll look at that too. Like, that feels like it's just bad, like a bad way of computing. Like, you almost would need two pipes so that each reader like, gets a chance to. Well, so we want. A, we, we can have two processors sharing a file descriptor, okay? 
and they can be sharing in a file. And they share the same offset within the file. And when one reads, it moves the offset. And then the next one reads, and it reads stuff. So um, we have this ability to interleave reading of a regular file. Yeah. We want to be able to do the same thing in a pipe as well. Okay. Okay. Commonly, you're not going to want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We will still get to the lock in a, in a second, Giselle, but it's still on its deck. So in our IDE, how do we use sleep and wake up? In the read-write, okay, so we're reading or writing a block, we acquire an IDE lock, and then we do some stuff, telling the hardware to do some stuff, and then we check the flags for the buffer. And we're trying to basically make sure they're valid. Okay, buffer says, there's some stuff with read and write, but here we're just looking as, did a read happen? Okay, so if it's not valid, then it's not done and we go to sleep. And when we wake up, we check and see is it valid. And if so, then we go do some stuff, release our lock. Okay. I removed a lot of code here because IDE rewrite is big. So we go to sleep. How does a read actually, do we know when a read completes? Because an interrupt occurs. So we get an interrupt. We acquire that same IDE lock. And now we want to say, hey, we're valid. That, that, that block is valid. Wake up whoever's waiting on that block, which will wake up that guy, right? And it'll release the lock. And we're going to talk about the lock in a moment and why we're actually passing this lock in here in a moment. Does the, does the general idea make sense here? So we want to have an IDE lock because we want to make sure we don't have two processes going and messing with these flags at the same time. Just yeah, to make it explicit, uh, if I call wake up on some channel, anyone, so like it's, it wakes up everyone who is sleeping on that? It wakes up everyone who is sleeping on that. And let me just, so uh, that's sometimes called, so where wake up wakes all sleepers can lead to a problem. Because a lot of times what happens is only one of them deals with it, and the rest all have to go check their condition and say, oh, it's not there. I have to go back to sleep. So that's something called the thundering herd problem. Uh, and this was an issue with Linux uh, at one point that affected performance, where they basically said, why do we want to wake up everyone? Let's just wake up one of them. So. Other questions? OK, so let's say, let's say we did not pass this lock in here. OK? So we're going to see what happens if we didn't pass this lock into sleep, because it seems like a weird thing. Instead, what we're going to do is we are going to define a broken sleep, which doesn't take a lock, just takes this channel. And we know somewhere we have to release that lock. And so we're going to release it before we go to sleep. OK? Because if we don't release it, the ID interrupt is not going to get to acquire it and not going to get to go through. So we ha it has to be released. So here's, what's going to, here's the, the problem that's going to happen. Let's say. All right, so here's what's going to happen. We are going to, in the normal case, this works fine. We release the lock. We go to sleep. The ID interrupt comes along. It acquires the lock. It goes through and sets the flags. It wakes us up. And then, eh, I forgot one thing in here. We really need to have in here a match with our release to have an acquire, right? They can't be unmatched. So we'll do a wake up. When we do a wake up, 
does this process that's waiting start running immediately? I heard a no. Give me an, an explanation of why no. Releasing the lock doesn't affect whether it wakes up or not. The schedule we need to switch. The scheduler on the CPU can't switch because we're in an interrupt, right? We have inter I mean, we have interrupts off because we're handling an interrupt. So that won't happen. Except, what if we're in a multi-CPU situation? So we go ahead and wake up this guy. Another CPU could start running it right away, right? So we're here, and we're also up here with sleep just having returned. But this guy's going to try and acquire the lock. And it'll spin trying to acquire the lock until we get down to here. Okay, so it is possible for both of these to be actually running at the same time. But the lock makes sure that one of them is going to be spin locking. So <coughs> once this actually gets released, this guy is going to have acquired the lock. It's going to go check and see, is it valid? And the answer is, yes, it's valid. And it's going to go do its thing, release its lock. And everything works perfectly. Okay, we just have a small window of vulnerability. So here's the window of vulnerability. And that is, if we have an interrupt here, OK? Let's look at what's going to happen. If we have an interrupt here, do we hold a lock? We do not hold the lock because we just gave it up. This guy's going to run, right? Is he going to get the lock? Yes. Is he going to set the flags to valid? Yes. Is he going to call wake up? Yes. Who's, wait who's sleeping? No one is waiting for this, right? There's no one sleeping on this channel. We release from here. This code says, oh, I'm going to sleep. Never to be kissed by the prince, right? Never to wake up. Because the prince already kissed thin air, right? And walked away, and he's gone. So this is the lost wake up problem. Let's reiterate what happened. One, IDRW um, released the lock. Then, interrupt. Then, IDE, interrupt. Then, wake up. Nobody wakes up, because nobody's waiting. And then five, we call broken sleep. Make sense? So, right. since no, nothing is going to wake it up since it already called wake up, would it be possible, like, if something else is put to sleep on that same channel again later down the line, and then because that sleep happened, a wake up is called, and then since it wake up, so wakes up everything on that channel, then it would wake up? It is exactly the case, you're right. If we don't really care if someone goes to sleep on that, uh, buffer, that channel. We care, does interrupt happen that wakes up someone in that channel? Yeah. And that would only happen, though, if someone actually starts something going. So if we reuse that buffer, yeah, yeah that, that could happen. Uh -huh. But probably what will happen is one or the other of them will wake up and deal with it, and then the other one will look and say, oh, it's not valid. I'm going back to sleep. So mm -hmm. it would be a problem. Uh, so uh, how does it interrupt again if you have interrupts off? Uh, in IDRW, we read-write, we don't have interrupts off. Yeah, interrupts are on here. Uh, wait a second. Let me think about this. Uh, we already decided for the duration of holding the lock, interrupts are off. So we have another CPU. 
that's doing an interrupt. Okay, that's handling the interrupt. So here's the solution. So the idea is we want to not let a wake up happen until this sucker is sleeping. So from the point we check the condition to when this is sleeping, we don't want that to happen. Uh, oh, actually, let me show you one other possible ordering of things. We do the acquire, we start the I.O., and then we just start going very slowly. Or it's a really, really fast piece of hardware, and it handles it and does our interrupt. Before our while loop. Uh, yeah, that's boring. It can't acquire the lock, so it's not going to be able to do things. Um, so this particular case doesn't work. Let's ignore that. There are other cases we'll talk about. So we want to lock out the wake up between us checking the condition of the while loop and when we're actually asleep. When we're actually asleep needs somewhere in um, in the sleep. So the sleep is going to have to turn off the lock or release the lock. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to say wake up has to hold a lock on the process table and also on whatever this uh, condition is. That is the lock that was passed in to sleep. And the sleeper And I'm sorry here, I just want to really say, sleeper at all times until sleeping. We hold one of the other locks. So when wake up is checking for this, it's got to hold both locks. The sleeper holds at least one or the other lock until it's actually asleep. And so therefore, wake up isn't going to be able to get in here and try and wake someone up while someone is in the midst of going to sleep. Let me show you the code for this, which is we're going to pass this lock in here. So what's sleep going to do? We didn't actually look at sleep before, so let's look at that now. We look and say, okay, what process is going to sleep? If it's zero, then we panic because that's not good. We are going to acquire the p-table lock. We want to acquire the p-table lock because we're going to be changing the state of something in the process table. I'll come back to the release lock for a second. We specify for this process it's waiting on this channel. We say it's sleeping, and now we call schedule. Right? Schedule is not going to return until we're awoke, awoken. Right? Because sketch is going to call the scheduler kernel thread, which is going to run some other thread. When we come back, we're not waiting on anything. Release the lock. Release the process table lock and reacquire that other lock that got passed in. So what happens is, When we enter sleep, do we have a lock? Held. Yes, we have the ID lock held. So when you call sleep and you pass the lock, you need to be holding it. Okay? So we know we had the lock before the while loop. We have the lock as we're entering sleep. If we didn't have the process table lock, we'd have an issue. Because as soon as we released here, we could have that same problem with the interrupt happening. So we're going to say, before we release this lock, acquire this other lock. Okay? So we don't have our passed in lock anymore, but we have the process table lock. 
and we're going to hold on the process table lock until we call sketch. Because remember, the scheduler says you have to hold the process table lock to come in. Okay. Why? Oh, okay. So you just sort of answer yeah. And so what's wake up going to do? Wake up's going to acquire this process table lock. Okay. So it can't happen anywhere in here. It can only happen after the scheduler runs and releases the lock. So it can happen after this guy's asleep, but it can't happen until this guy is asleep. We're going to run through and we're going to just look through everything in the process table and say, is anyone sleeping, waiting on this channel? If so, say that it's runnable. And then release the lock. So let's see, I have a picture here. So the sleeper looks like this. Whoever is sleeping acquires the lock and then Here, we call sleep, and we pass in the lock. And what does sleep do? Sleep acquires the p-table lock and then releases the other lock. Okay? So at all points in time from here until here, until now we're actually asleep. We have one or both locks. And this guy, who's the waker, holds the lock. So acquires the lock before calling. So here's the call to wake up. So again, this is an agreement that the users of sleep and wake up have to have. And that is the person who calls wake up has to hold the same lock that got passed into sleep. And then while we're in wake up, we grab the lock, mark that guy as runnable, release the lock, Release the other lock. This is what avoids the lost wake up problem. Okay. Questions on that before I go to another? Yeah. So can you quickly um, summarize again like what the purpose of each of, the, of each of the two locks is? Yep. So the, so the P table lock. Um, protects the process table, right? So anytime you're doing anything to a process in the process table, you need to have that lock because any other CPU could be looking and trying to see what happens. We know we have to hold the P table lock when we call sketch. Right? The LK is shared between the sleeper and the waker. Okay? And so the sleeper has to have it when they call sleep, and the waker has to have it when they call wake up. Does that help? So that means right. while well, wake up is running, no, nothing else will be able to go to sleep because they won't be able to acquire the lock because wake up is currently, the waker currently has the lock? Yeah, if the waker currently has the lock, no one's going to be able to go to sleep. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the order in which things happen, like I'm going to go to sleep waiting for something, sorry, I'm going to check and see if this condition is true, and if it's not, I'm going to go to sleep. And the thing that, that makes that condition true happens in the other order. So the, the code that calls wake might run first. For example, the case where we have a reader that's reading in a pipe. We want to see is the buffer, is there stuff in the buffer? Okay. And a writer writes to a pipe and wakes anything who's to the buffer and wakes anything's waiting. So let's say that the waker writes first. So someone writes to the pipe. So it goes through, it acquires a lock, it writes some stuff, it wakes up, because it doesn't know whether anyone's waiting or not, right? So it wakes up, whoever's waiting, in which case there's no one, and then it's done. So now we've got a buffer with some stuff in it. And now the reader runs. Well, this is the <coughs> lock. LK. 
So the reader runs, and it says, OK, let me go look. Is there something in the buffer? Yes. Do I have to go to sleep? No. Actually, I don't say if there's something in the buffer. I say while there's not something in the buffer, sleep, which I don't have to do. I just jump past that, and I then go consume my data. So we have to make sure that our wake up and release works right in these, in, in, no matter which one happens first. And our locks make this work. It can be tedious and the source of errors, right? The fact that you have to make sure that the wake up and the sleep are so carefully crafted. There are other sequence primitives you can use, like counting semaphores, condition variables, which you'll see in the next homework. Uh, weight cues, these are the, basically, this fixes the thundering herd problem. And this is one where it, it wakes up one instead of multiple ones. The, the way we have implemented uh, sleep and wake in XB6 is very primitive. We just, and when you wake up, go through everyone in the process table, seeing if anyone's waiting. It's kind of silly. If you could have a queue associated with a channel, then you could just go look at that queue. That's what a wake queue is. It's a just an optimization. So we talked about pipes. Here's how pipes work. We've got this circular buffer, right? Circular buffer meaning that we keep writing into it, and when we get to the end, we go around to the beginning and write some more. And same for reading. So we've got this data. We've got one reference, is, which is how many bytes have been read, and another, which is how many bytes have been written. So when we write bytes, we increment in write. But whenever we actually do writing or do reading, we always use modulo for whatever the size of this buffer is. Okay. So in write is always greater than or equal to in read. And could I have in write pointing here? Yes. Because in write's allowed to be bigger, but when we actually write, we're going to do modulo this. So it'll be writing in the right spot. So here's what a writer does. A writer says, we've got a pipe. The pipe has a lock. Let's acquire it before we do anything to this pipe. And then while the amount written is equal to read plus pipe size. That is, if our write has gotten ahead of the read by the total buffer size, then we're full. Right? So this says full. Okay. While we're full, we want to do two things. Wake up anyone who's, who's waiting to read and go to sleep. Okay with the lock of the pipe. I'm going to get to this other part in just a moment. And then we do writing. Notice how we're doing the, here the modulo, the pipe size, and we just write bytes. Okay, So we have a loop where we're going through writing bytes. And after we write every byte, we check and see are we full. If we're full, we're going to tell anyone who's reading, hey, wake up. I want you to go read some stuff. And we're going to, then go to sleep ourselves, saying we're waiting for something to write. Right. We have two channels here. In read is one channel, and in write is another channel. Okay. Um, and once we've written everything that we have, that we were asked to write, then we go out again, wake up anyone who's reading, get rid of lock. Questions. So when um, so these can these uh, wake this wake wake up sleep thing can work between multiple processes, right? Not just between different threads in a single process. So what we're looking at right now is the XV6 implementation of this, and this is all kernel threads. So sleep we don't sleep and wake are not system calls, um, although they perhaps could so be. This is, only, this is only within the kernel. The uh, 
check here. Is anyone waiting to read? How many readers are there? If there's no one waiting to read, why write? Right? So we just return negative one and say the pipe's been, basically it's a pipe's been closed. Or what is this? We're going to see this a little bit later. Killed basically says our process is dead. If our process is dead, let's not write anymore. Let's just bail out of here. And the reading is pretty much opposite. We're going to keep sleeping while the buffer's empty. How do we know the buffer's empty? Because the amount read and the amount written is the same. So we've read everything there is. And again, if we've been killed, go away. And then we go through and do our writing. Breaking if the buffer becomes full. Wake up anyone who is waiting to write and return. Interchanged. So here we have an outer for loop, right? And within it, we can go to sleep. So let me try and think of this one. Why don't we do the same thing? So the difference has to ha happens with the fact that the write is supposed to complete. Right? If I write 10 bytes, I want to I want to write all 10 bytes. Unless the we get killed or unless there's no more reader. In a read case, when you're asked to read, you should read whatever there is. So we the first while loop here makes sure there's something and then we read whatever that is. Okay, so if you're asked to read 10 bytes and you only have five, you can get back a five. So that's good to know in general on Unix. If you make a read call, you may get a return result that's less than you asked for. And that's okay. But you always get something. You always get something. Exactly, you're gonna wait for there to be something. Does that make, it's a good question. Okay. Uh, terminating sleeping thread. So, you wanna terminate a process. We can't just, in our process, like let's say we get a page fault okay, for a process. So we're in our kernel thread. We get a page fault. We can't just go ahead and remove the page directory and remove the kernel stack and all that other stuff. Why can't we, Brad, remove the kernel stack? Because you know, usually the kernel stack always stays the same. So you Remember, we have a kernel stack per process in XV6. So, why can't a process, let's just say a kernel thread, uh, <coughs> clean up after itself? Where clean up means uh, free the pages, uh, free the page dir, uh, free the kernel stack, free the user stack, right, all that stuff. So what could go wrong here? I'm not really sure. Okay. Anyone have a thought? I mean, you could end up freeing pages that you're trying to actively write to, or like have local variables you need. Local variables. Where are local variables? On the stack. Uh -huh. Which stack are you talking about? User stack or kernel stack? stack? Kernel stack. Okay. So we're executing on, right, this is proc A, and we're, here's the kernel stack. And this is where we are, right? And we're executing in here. If we free this, 
to allow some other processor to go allocate. I mean, it'd just be awful, right? Because we're, we're executing and using this. So we can't do it ourselves. We have to get some, it's an assisted suicide. Okay, so all we can do in a kill is set ourselves to be killed. Just mark that we've been killed. And that's about all we can do, uh, except if it was sleeping, let's wake it up, right? Because otherwise it'll never wake up. Uh, it could never wake up. So if it's sleeping, wake it up and it'll notice it's killed, probably. So we're going to also, if we've got a, uh, so here, oh, this isn't the one I want. If we've got, for instance, if we notice we've been killed when a system call happens, we'll want to exit. We'll see what that does in a moment. Or after the system call, because the system call itself might be the kill system call that takes a process ID. And we might have decided to kill ourselves in user mode. Right? There are a variety of ways from a user can kill the process. Do a bad address or call kill on itself. Um, and in general then, in our, in our trap, if we've been killed, we call exit. And if we get a page fault, we'll so set killed, call exit. The question was basically like, why can't it kill itself? And the answer was because it, like local variables or other info that was in the stack is still being used elsewhere. Yeah. It's executing on the stack. Yeah. We can't get rid of the stack mm -hmm. because then we couldn't keep executing. You know, if we call sketch, okay. that uses the kernel stack, for instance. Okay. So we couldn't get out into some other thread. So it should be killed and it'll be set to be killed. But it it's set be, to be killed. It be That's killed right. it it's be not going to be killed right now. So exit can't do it. Yeah. What's exit going to do? Exit's going to basically say, uh, wake up our parent, because they may be waiting on our result. Another good use of sleep and wake up. And then if we have any children that are killed, Uh, let me back a second. If we have any children, we can't be their parents anymore. We have to adopt them out to someone else because we'll no longer be there to care for them. So we're going to go ahead and set their parent to be the init proc. That was ID one, the very first init that happens. Right? And if that process is in what's called a zombie state, go ahead and tell the init proc We'll get to that, okay? Let's ignore that part, but we're going to re-adopt our children. And then we're going to mark ourselves as a zombie. Zombies will never run. We call the scheduler. The scheduler swaps us out, goes into the scheduler thread. That goes into another thread. No scheduler is ever going to try and run this again. But we still exist. So far, all of our memory allocated and so on is still there. So what happens? Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, well, who's going to deal with it? When should we actually get rid of it? <coughs> and I'll tell you what it is. Basically, if, if a child dies, the parents are responsibility to run the funeral. Okay, so I'm sorry to be so morbid. So um, here's what happens. Wait, right? The wait call, which is a system call, is going to return the result of a child, right? So we're going to go through and look for a child. And we're going to go through and say, okay, we've got one whose parent is me, and it's a zombie. If it's a zombie, free up all the stuff and get rid of it. Okay? So the only time the process's uh, resources go away 
is when a parent waits for it. That's why you should always wait for your children. But what if someone doesn't? We have a bad, right? What happens if a parent never calls wait? <coughs> the, the children just stay there as zombies until either the parent waits for them or the parent dies. Because what happens if the parent dies? We re-parent that child. And we say, you now belong to the init proc. And init, this is init. Init goes through and just waits. It's like, I'm waiting. That's my job. I wait for dead children or zombie children. Okay, And by waiting for them, I ensure that they get a peaceful entombment or something. So, OK? That's it. Uh, I will be in the cafe until 3.30. So from here on out, Wednesday afternoons, I'll be in the cafe. It's much nicer than the lab. See you next week. Just a reminder that we have the midterm a week from Monday.